Well, hey, South Point Church, it's good to be here today. Uh, today's a good day. Today is Sunday. It's church day. And that gets me really excited. Um, if you missed us last week, we had a lot of fun. Last week was a great week. Um, yeah, if you miss us, I just, I want to see you here. So if you know somebody that wasn't a part of Sunday service last week, let them know about it today. It's not too late. So we can still invite people. We can still let people know that they can log on. Um, but yeah, it's just so fun. It's so good to be in front of you. It's so good to bring God's word to you. And it's so good for us to be a church, even if we're digital. Uh, we may not be uh, meeting in person, but we are still a church. That part doesn't change. That part never goes away. So anyway, anyway, Let's get on with it. Today is our series wrap up. We've been on a series called How Not to Be Your Own Worst Enemy. And the reason that we chose this series to start the year off was because we felt like it would be important to give you guys three habits that you could do that would set you up for a success this year. So we wanted to start the year off with a bang. And with week one, we looked at a story between David and Saul, and it was about pay attention to your tension. And the idea behind that was that as things come up, as you think about decisions, as you think about doing something, you've got maybe this sort of gut feeling that rises, this tension that rises up in you. And, and as that rises up, we talked about like, hey, you know, maybe it would be good to pay attention to that. Maybe, maybe you should, you should look, you know, kind of listen to that. And we saw with David and Saul, uh, the story, this amazing story uh, of Saul's bathroom break in the Bible. So if you miss that, you can go back and, and watch week one. But Saul takes a bathroom break in a cave with David and David doesn't kill him. And what was amazing is that it was David paying attention to the tension. It was the pause that David gave to the tension that actually defeated a king. And um, so that was, that was really cool. The second week, we talked about our narratives. Now, our narratives are things where we've let things shape the way that we see the world. And we talked about how sometimes, well, actually, most of the time, we don't get to make the decision on the things that shape how we see the world, such as, where was I born? Where was I raised? How did my family raise me? How did I experience the world? All those things shape our narrative. And then we looked at Paul and how Paul had this narrative based on the way he was raised. And then he had this narrative changing experience, this life changing experience, and it led him to change his narrative. And then God used him in this incredible way. I mean, it was, last week was a great, great message. I felt like it was a powerful message for the church that, that the church has had a narrative changing experience and that as a church, we can go out and help other people have these narrative changing experiences with Jesus. So that was the first two weeks. Now this week, we're gonna jump right into it. This week, we're gonna talk about listening. So the, the third thing this week is all about Listening. Now, there's two types of people out there. There's those of you that didn't hear me, and then there's those of you that know someone who needed to hear me. So in 1 Kings, we're going to pick up our story, and it starts in, in 1 Kings 12, and it, it says this. Now, I know we're just, we're jumping right in. We're just jumping into the deep end. If you get a little bit lost, it's okay. I'm going to I'm going to come back and get you. So trust me on this one. Trust me here. So we're going to jump into this text. Rehoboam, we're going to have a lot of Boams and different, different names in this one. Rehoboam went to Shechem for all Israel had gone there to make him king. And then verse three says, and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, and we will serve you. So then after, after this, okay, so, so what's, what exactly is happening here? 
okay? We're gonna, we're gonna unpack this a little bit. We're gonna unpack this verse. Um, first of all, let's start, because I don't wanna assume that people know everything here. Let's, let's talk about what was, who is Israel? So in verse three, it says, the, the entire assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam. Well, if you remember, in, or if you don't know this, let me tell you, in the Old Testament, Israel was God's chosen people. So Israel was the group of people that, that sort of Moses led out of Egypt and led into the promised land, and they were the, the Israelites. And then they formed a nation, and when they went into the promised land, they formed a nation. And then eventually, uh, they asked God for a king, and God gave them a king. And now we come to a place where Israel is kind of this established nation, okay? And they've now had three kings before. David was one of those kings, and we, we talked about David. Saul was one of those kings. And now we come to the fourth king. So here in this story, in this verse, we see our fourth king, uh, Solomon is, is coming to the end of his reign and then his son Rehoboam is now going to, going to step in. So what we have here in this verse is we have all of Israel, the assembly of God's people, and they've come together. And we've got Rehoboam who went to, went to Shechem to go and see all of Israel. And then this stuff in verse four, where they say, hey, your father put a heavy yoke on us. What that is, is talking about Solomon. So Solomon was their, was their leader. And Solomon, he was, he was actually an amazing king. He, the, the book Song of Solomon was written by him. A lot of Proverbs was written by him. He was said to be the wisest man on earth, the richest man on earth. And in fact, for a long period of time, Solomon brought great peace to the kingdom of Israel. And one of the ways that that happened actually ended up being part of Solomon's downfall because see Solomon, uh, he falls away from God because he actually starts to worship other, uh, other gods. Uh, part of Solomon's peace treaty was that he would actually marry other women in other kingdoms. And that was sort of a way that he had peace with, with those kingdoms. And so it happens, Solomon's got all these wives and he ends up worshiping some of their gods. And so now Solomon, who had this very intimate relationship with God, has become sort of a pagan because he's worshiping multiple gods. And as part of that, he gets a little bit full of himself. And so he starts taking the Israelites and having them build all these monuments to himself. So he's, he's got hundreds of thousands of, of even just stone cutters that are doing nothing but building monuments for, for Solomon. And so he actually starts to just work people like slaves. I mean, so, which, yeah, he just works them, to, he just works them to the bone, he puts them to work and he's, he's building just for himself. So now Solomon dies. And when Solomon dies, Rehoboam is supposed to take over. And so that, that's where we are right here. And so Solomon's died. Now Rehoboam, his son, because the way kingship worked is when the king died, the son came in and, and the son took over. Rehoboam's son, go, son goes to Shechem. The reason they went to Shechem is because they didn't have Zoom at the time. So they couldn't do like a Zoom meeting and get all of Israel together. They couldn't do an AGM uh, over Zoom like we do here at church. And so it was traditional that, that all of the people would come to a chosen city and the potential or the new king would come to the city and he would sort of greet the people and then he would sort of be reinstated. So, so we have all of Israel comes to meet Rehoboam. And that's where we are in the story right here. So Rehoboam, we know who he is. We know who Israel is. We know how Rehoboam got there because he came from Saul and Saul died. And we know that there's no Zoom meetings or Google Meet or Hangouts. And so you've got the new king and then you've got all of Israel and they come together and they have this interaction. And that, that's where our story is gonna be today. And we're gonna follow Rehoboam. We're gonna tell a story. We're gonna tell the story of Rehoboam and then we're gonna learn some things from that story that's gonna help us not be our own worst enemy. So, 
the exciting thing here is that God, I believe, is gonna use part of this story to completely change our lives. So if you're open to that, then, then let's go forward with it. So in this meeting, so in, in the meeting that we have right here, the, the Israelites come to Rehoboam and they say in verse four, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us and we will serve you. So this is, this is already looking pretty good for Rehoboam. He comes to his people that he's hoping to be king of and the people come to him and the first thing they do is they offer their full service to him. They say, hey, Rhea or Boam or Rehoboam, I don't know if they did nicknames or not, but he says, they, they say, hey, we're totally cool with serving you. We're totally cool. We're in, man. We're, we're in. We're good with it. But if you, you know, if you could just, we have one appeal. If you could just maybe, you know, your dad worked us pretty hard. So if you can maybe just, just tone it down a little bit. And if you could do that, then we're totally in. So from King Rehoboam's perspective, I mean, could life be any easier than this? You know, I mean, it's so easy. He gets a smiley face on the screen here. I mean, King Re Rehoboam, his dad dies. Dude shows up to Shechem and the people are just ready to submit for life. I mean, Rehoboam is the man. He's got it all put together for him. And, and all the people ask for is this tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of relief. And they say, hey, if you give us this, just this, yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's a little relief, then we'll, we'll serve you forever. Easy decision, right? All done. Let's pray. God, no, it's not all done. So this is where we actually introduce Rehoboam's tension. And Rehoboam's tension is something that's going to take us through, through this story. And then later, we're going we're gonna to unpack this a little bit more. So Rehoboam has showed up, Israel has asked him for a little bit of relief. And he actually does the right thing here. He does an amazing thing here. The first thing he does when they say, if you'll lighten the load, we'll be your people forever, is he says, you know what? Let me go away and think about this first. Let me just, mm, let me just take a minute and think. And actually in verse five, it says this, Rehoboam answers and he says, Go away for three days and then come back to me. So the people went away. Simple enough. So far, so good. I mean, Rehoboam's making good decisions. I mean, we're, we're right into the beginning of the story. Everything's falling into place. You've got a new king and, and he's doing, you know, he's making good decisions and you've got the people have showed up and they're like, hey man, we're all for you. Just got this one little thing. So things are are going really well and, and Rehoboam reinforces that and he even makes another good decision. The second good decision that he makes is he actually asked the elders and what the elders were was a, was a wiser group of people than him. In verse six, it says this, King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father, Solomon, during his lifetime. So, I mean, hey, that's pretty good, you know, smart guy there. King Rehoboam has now done two really, really smart things. Um, you know, he makes two really, really great decisions. I wonder if, if maybe Rehoboam listened to part one and part two of this sermon series, because the first thing he did was what we talked about the first week, pause. So Rehoboam paused and sent people away for three days. And then the second thing he did was he opened himself up to have his narrative shifted. And um, that's the second thing we, we preached on. And so, yeah, I mean, maybe Rehoboam listened to my sermon. That's pretty cool. Um, obviously, that's impossible. But he goes on in verse six to say this. He says, how would you advise me? So this is Rehoboam talking to the elders. So He's, he sent the people away for three days and now he goes and he speaks to his elders and he says, how would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. They replied. So the elders give a little bit of advice here. He said, they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. 
So the elders are basically saying to him, do you want to be king? Just putting it as simple as possible. Rehoboam, do you want to be king? Do you want to have a united kingdom? Well, here is how you can do that. They spell it out real simple. And the underlying message to what they were saying was, Rehoboam, you're going to have to put their interest ahead of yours. So remember that part I talked about a little bit earlier, that part about, uh, you know, the, the tension? Well, that comes back up here because Rehoboam, he had the opportunity to be a king. He had that chance. But that opportunity actually had a problem. That problem was the people. The problem had an issue. So the people had an issue. They were treated badly. But the issue had a solution. The solution was that Rehoboam was going to listen to the elders and he was going to give them a little bit of relief and then they were going to serve him forever. But we still had a problem. The elders' advice, it wasn't exactly what he needed to hear. Or no, it was, it was what he needed to hear. It was not exactly what he wanted to do. So Rehoboam had been given advice that he needed to hear, but it wasn't maybe what he wanted to do. So what, what we see here is this classic example, and we do this all the time. I mean, how much do we do this in our day-to-day life? We discount the merit of the advice because of the source. And we saw Rehoboam do this with the elders. Rehoboam says, you know, I'm, I'm going to discount the merit of your good advice. Yes, you're giving me good advice, but I'm not going to take it because, you know, you guys are these old guys. You guys are like the old men that were around when my dad was around. Well, I'm not into that. So, yeah, you know, I'm not listening to you guys. I mean, how often do we do that? We do that all the time. We discount the merit of good advice because we don't like the source that it comes from. And that's what he does, that's what he does here. You know, the, or you could say it this way, we discount the source and we just ignore the merit. So we say, you know what, the source of this advice is maybe really good, but I'm just going to find a way to discredit or discount this source. You know, maybe they don't know what they, what they think they know, or maybe they're not as educated as me, or they come from a different background than me, or they don't understand me, or they're not in with my vision, or whatever. But whatever it is, we say, okay, I'm just going to discredit the source. And then even though I know that the advice they're given is probably pretty good, I'm just going to ignore the merit of it. I'm going to say, okay, you know what, I'm just going to ignore it. And that's exactly what Rehoboam has done here. So he didn't get what he wanted. Rehoboam did not get the answer that he wanted. And so now if we go to 1 Kings 12, 8, it actually says, says Rehoboam's response to the elders. It says, but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up him, who had grown up with him and were serving with him. Can you believe it? So the only thing that Rehoboam had to do was show up at Shechem, listen to Israel, take their complaints, go back to the people that were wiser than him, that were in place for him, the people that their whole job was to consult him and give him the kingdom. Their whole job was to get him the kingdom. He goes back to them. They give him amazing advice that ensures that he gets the kingdom. And then he says, "Ah, it's not really what I wanted. It's It's not the way that I wanted it. So Rehoboam, he had the keys to the kingdom placed right in his hands. He made two really good decisions. He was on the right path. But but the problem with it, and this comes up in our hearts as well, just just because advice is good, it doesn't mean that we take it. And the problem here is that Rehoboam, he had his father's men. They were wise, but he didn't see them as yes men. He saw them maybe as no men because it wasn't the pathway that he picked to get to where he wanted to go. So Rehoboam, he knew that he had a group of guys, his men, and that they were yes men. 
But see, that introduces this problem. The problem when we, when the problem, when the only people who have access to your decisions are people who need something from you, then you're in the danger zone. And that's where, that's where Rehoboam was. He's in the, he's in the danger zone. Top Gun fans, come on. If you're not singing the danger zone song in your head right now, so Rehoboam has, has surrounded himself with yes men. And, and we, we can do that. We can always find someone to tell us what we want to hear. So we can always find, if, if we really want something bad enough, we can always find somebody that will agree that we need it, that we deserve it. You know, if, if we really want to spend that money on that thing, we can always justify it. If, if we really want to buy that new car and nine people tell us no, we find the one guy that tells us yes, it's like, oh, that's it. That's done, you know? I, in fact, I'll tell a personal story. I had this happen uh, even to us this week. My wife, uh, I've wanted to get her a, a new watch and there's all these watches out now that have these uh, blood oxygen uh, sensors in them that tell your blood oxygen. And with the COVID outbreak that we're in, Everyone's talking about testing their, their blood oxygen levels. And I'm like, that's it. That's all I needed. And now I've got permission. I'm going to go out and spend some money, get her a watch. And if she gets a watch, then maybe I get a watch. So now we're both looking at two brand new watches. Pretty good, right? You know, I didn't do it. But the temptation is there. And it's easy when that temptation is there to find something, somebody, someone that will agree with us and give us the advice that, that we want. Now, we know that this doesn't always work out for the best. We're gonna see it in Rehoboam's story. It doesn't work out in his best interest. And we know for us, it doesn't work out in our best interest. And in fact, the problem with doing, the, the, problem, the problem with always doing what you want to do is you eventually arrive at precisely where you don't wanna be. I mean, that's how, if we talk about spending money, that's how you end up in debt. The problem with doing what you always wanna do is you eventually arrive at precisely where you don't wanna be, which is with no money. The problem with doing what you always wanna do in maybe relationships or in work or in how you treat people or in getting your own ways, you eventually end up where you don't want to be, which is maybe lonely or by yourself or fired or, you know, all these other things that it could be. The point is, is that, is that our, our deep desires that we want, our deepest longings don't actually lead us to the place that we want to be. They, they oftentimes, more than that, more than anything, can lead us to a place that we, we realize that we don't want to be there. Now, this is foreshadowing a little bit. So let, let me, in case I've lost anybody, let me sum this up a little bit here. So again, you have Rehoboam, comes to the people, the people say we're yours, give us a little bit of a break. He goes back and he takes a break, he gets some advice, Elders tell him, hey, here's how you get the keys to the kingdom. He doesn't listen to them. Instead, he, uh, he says, no, I'm going to reject them. I'm not going to listen to them. And, and this right here is the point where, where tension wins in Rehoboam's life. This is the point where, where Rehoboam actually stops listening. And we actually see in verse 9, so old, old Rehoboam here, he says, he asked them, what, what is your advice? So again, this is Rehoboam talking with the, with the young men, his mates, you know, his bros. I mean, we all know that, that if our parents tell us one thing and we don't like it, we can always go to our friends, you know, at school or in university or even our coworkers. If your boss tells you something that you don't like, you can always go to like your coworkers. And it's super easy to sit there with your coworkers and be like, hey, guys, or that lady is wrong. No, that's not the answer I wanted to hear. I want this answer. This is what we deserve. You know, this is, this is what we deserve. And that's, that's what Rehoboam's done now. He's basically in verse nine, he said, he said hey, what's, what's your advice? What, hey, my friends that grew up with me, that are in my back pocket, that need me to succeed so that they succeed, the people that are taking a little bit off the top from what I have, hey, you guys... 
what, what's your advice on how I handle Israel? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke that your father put on us? So now we have a big problem. We have a really big problem. So Rehoboam is not listening to the elders and he's consulted his, uh, his friends and they've given him, well, you know, they're about to give him some really bad advice. And Rehoboam's ready to listen to him. At, at this point, he is listening, but to the wrong thing. So in verse 10, we see the young men who had grown up with him replied, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them this. This is, this is funny. This is, um, they're, they're actually giving Rehoboam uh, an illustration to use. So they're, they're saying not only should you go and, and come down on them and reject them, but we're actually going to give you an illustration that's going to drive your point home. And they say, now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. So back in that day, when, when a person was a big person, it was actually seen as, as a sign of wealth or strength. And Solomon was probably a big guy. He was the wealthiest guy. I mean, some of us today, you know, we, we wish that maybe those rules applied today, uh, but, they, but they, don't, they don't. So you have to, you have to put yourself in, the, in that day and in those times. And you had a working class of people that were largely slaves to the king. And they were constantly working for the king. Um, and so those guys and, and those girls were probably pretty fit or pretty lean. But if you were eating fat from meat or, or things like that, it meant that you had some wealth. It meant that there was something about you. you. You maybe had some power. And so if Solomon had all the power, if Solomon was the wealthiest guy to ever be in the kingdom, then you, know, you can imagine Solomon as a pretty big guy. And so, so Rehoboam's friends are saying, you know what? You should, you should say, my little finger has got more in it than Solomon has in his entire waist. I think there's a, a saying that we use today that says, you know, something like, I've got more strength in my little finger than you have in your whole body or, you know, or, or something like that. Maybe that's where this came from. But what's happening is, is Rehoboam is being led by his young friends He's being led into a place of, of displaying his power. He's being led in a way that, that teaches him how to display power to the people of Israel. So the young men go on to say in verse 11, they say this, my father, so now they're telling Rehoboam, do the finger thing, make sure and do the finger thing, and then after you've done the finger thing, I want you to say, my father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father sc scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. Can you imagine Rehoboam out there with like actual scorpions? Just with a, I don't know if it means he's got a bucket of scorpions, like a bucket of KFC, and he's just walking around and, and chucking scorpions at the Israelites. That'd be funny, but that's not actually what it means. What it actually means is... There were certain types of whips that were used on certain people. So Solomon had enslaved the people, and there was a certain type of whip for that. So it's, that's why it says, my father scourged you with whips. So, so the people would get whipped if they weren't working, or they weren't working to Solomon's expectations, or whoever was in charge's expectations. And so that was a whip for slaves. But there was a different whip for prisoners. And that whip was called a scorpion whip. And it was actually made of metal and bone. And so they laced metal and bone together and made a whip out of it. And they called it, you know, a scorpion whip. And so that's what they use on criminals. So this statement that Rehoboam is saying here, this statement that his friends have coached him into saying, is basically like saying, hey, if you thought it was bad that my father treated you like slaves... Well, I'm going to be even heavier on you. And guess what? I'm going to treat you like, the crim like a criminal. I'm going to treat you like the criminals that you actually are. Now, this is a big statement here. It's a big, big statement. And Rehoboam has been coached into this really big statement. So then three days later, we see in verse 13, 
So the, the, the king answers. So before we, before we read this here, the king has now returned. So the three days are up. So they've had their consultation. Uh, Rehoboam's gone back and got the advice. Three days later, they come back together at Shechem. And they come back and the king answers the people. And in verse 13, it says, the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given him by the elders. So I mean, Rehoboam told them exactly what his young friends said to tell them. He went on to say in the, in the text, he repeated it word for word. He tells Israel absolutely everything that he was coached to tell them. And th this I find really, really interesting. Israel just flat out rejects him. Just flat out rejects Rehoboam. And, and this is what I think is very interesting is that Israel didn't reject Solomon. But they've rejected, they've rejected him. And in fact, when Israel rejects him, they just, they just turn around and leave. I mean, they just like walk out. And now you have a divided kingdom. You have 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel's made up of 12 tribes. 10 of those tribes just, just walk out. They say, we're done. We're out of here. And in fact, Rehoboam gets a little bit desperate and he sends, uh, he sends this guy that, that he's got in charge of all of his labors, forced labor, sends him out to talk to the people of Israel and to get them back working. They actually stoned the dude to death. I mean, they, Israel makes a huge statement there. They say, no, bro, we're done. Like you had the chance and now we're done. So Rehoboam's failure to listen led to a divided kingdom here. And a divided kingdom led to a vulnerable kingdom. And a vulnerable kingdom, it was gonna go on to lead to an invadable kingdom. So the kingdom is now weakened. And we would see through all the rest of scripture, Israel is divided and they stay divided. They never come back together. And they stay weakened and they get invaded. And it all came down to a moment in time when a man was given an opportunity to listen and he didn't. Instead, he chose something else. So this is where I wanna go one step further. So this is kind of the end of the story of, of Rehoboam. And I know that we took kind of a long journey of getting there. And it all, it all comes down to this here. And, and we're almost done and then, then we'll be out of here. And in fact, the whole series comes down to, to this point right here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna connect the dots for you. So Rehoboam, this man, this king that made a dumb decision, Rehoboam is actually me. He's actually, he's you. But if you're you and you're looking at this, then you would say in your head, oh, Rehoboam is me. That's why I've got me up here instead of you. But me applies to all of us. So, I mean, how, how is this so? So we're Rehoboam, we can be this in our daily decisions. You know, we all ignore good advice, we all uh, decide not to listen to things that we know we should listen to. It affects our work, it affects our family, it affects our money, it impacts us everywhere, our home life. But we all get an opportunity to, to get good counsel and then we turn around and we take bad counsel because it's not what we wanted. So I mean, we can all find ourselves in this. We can all find ourselves in, in, in Rehoboam. You know, we, we all need wise counsel. We all need it. Now, this is where I wanna take it one step further. See, what I could do is I could just leave this right here at being practical. I could just, I could just leave this. I, we could finish the message now. And that this, this would be it. This would be a good, a good tame message. This would be a, just a good message. Great advice, Chris. You, you dug through the Bible, you found a, a story in the Bible and it talked about you know, a guy needed good advice. Okay, I get it, I get it. Now when I go home and my wife or my husband tells me this, I need to do it because they're giving me good advice or you know, I need to uh, listen to the right people and stop listening to the wrong people, you know, all those things. Yes, that's true, that's true. But that we're not gonna leave it there. 
there's something deeper here. There's something that's, that's much more special here. So Rehoboam, he actually, and this is where we're, are you ready? I want you to lean into this. So take the, take the sort of the box that is the good advice box, where, where, where most sermons or most teachings are, are going to stop. And let's get out of that box. Okay, let's open up our minds. And now let's get into something that's really, really good. Something that's really special to me. So Rehoboam represents fallen man. See, we, we're actually all fallen people. We're all fallen people. And Rehoboam represents fallen man. Remember, Rehoboam is me. See, if you, if you believe in God and you know the Bible and you know the Old Testament, you'll know about Adam. You know that God created Adam. He loved Adam. And God used to walk through the garden with Adam. And he gave Adam a counterpart. And that counterpart came with it from within God. And the two of them were together. And, and in the afternoons, God gave them a cool breeze. And they walked together in this beautiful relationship. And then Adam and Eve didn't listen they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And when they did that, they, sin was entered into the world. And with that sin, they were separated from God. See, here we have again, at the beginning of time, Adam didn't listen to a simple commandment. And with that, he was thrown out of the garden. But also with that, he lost the kingdom. Just like Rehoboam didn't listen to the wise elders, he lost his kingdom. Adam didn't listen to the wise advice of his heavenly creator, and he lost his kingdom. And when we don't listen, when we haven't listened as man, we become separated from God. And when I say man, I also mean women. Now, this is how this message can actually change your life. This is how we're actually gonna, we're actually gonna change lives. Th this is where life change can actually come in. So if, if we're Rehoboam, if, if we go back to this Rehoboam is me, and we even take it back to Adam and what he did was sin, if we're Rehoboam, then we're sinful. I mean, we're born into that. I don't have to teach my 19, 20 month year old how to do bad things. He just, I didn't teach him to kick the dog. But he just knows how to kick the dog. Wakes up one day, walks over to poor Craven, and just kick. You know, we don't have to teach him bad behavior. It's in him. It's in us. No one teaches us how to lie or how to manipulate. We do it because it's in our nature. We, we're born with this sinful nature. We're, we're born because we, we don't listen. We don't hear. We, we didn't listen and we're born into sin. Now, our wise counsel is Jesus. He's, he's the one that gives us the good advice. But we always have that tension, okay, that tension between listening to what our, our flesh wants, listening to what our desires are, and then maybe also listening to what, what God wants or what God is, is showing or what God is saying. You know, sometimes we, 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 we listen and we make the right decision. Sometimes we don't listen and we make the wrong decision. But no matter what, though, there's something really, really important here. If, if, this is, if this is us and if sin has separated us from God, then I can show you, I can prove to you the relentless pursuit of Jesus for you. So... Jesus, because of Jesus, we don't have to stay a Rehoboam. We don't have to stay, uh, we don't have to stay in that position. See, Jesus pursued us. He died on a cross for us. Jesus was our wise counsel. He wants to help us. He wants to love us. He, he wants to talk to us. The reason that God wants us to listen is because he actually has something to say. So this is more about, this is more than just about taking good advice. This is about your soul and your heart being on the line. See, God knew that we would all be just like Rehoboam. He knew it. God knew that we would do just like him, that we would have the keys to the kingdom placed in our hands, whether it be making wise financial decisions or whether it be actual life-changing decisions. God knew that we would have it placed in our hands and that we, we wouldn't take the wise decision. But no matter what we do, 
Jesus proves that he pursues after us. He gave us a pathway to him, to his voice. So what happens when we hear God now, today? We get the kingdom. So now we're going to answer the two questions that we answer every single week. And the first question is, where is Jesus in this? Where do we find Jesus in this? So the place where we find Jesus in this is we find Jesus is the creator of the universe. He's our heavenly father. He is God. And where we find Jesus in this is, is at every turn, at every corner where we've made the wrong decision, in every place where we've made something, we've done something that was unwise, everything that we've ever done, every sin, every wrong decision, everything that separates us from God, from the beginning of time all the way back to Adam, Jesus has never, ever, ever stopped pursuing. We see Jesus after Adam sinned, God gave them a sacrifice so that they could still have a relationship with him. We see God chase the Israelites down. We see God over and over and over again show grace on Israel. We see Jesus comes down to earth and he hangs on the cross in, in order to give us forgiveness. No matter what decision we make, no matter what advice we listen to or don't listen to, the most important thing that we can take away from this is Rehoboam had one chance. He had one opportunity and he lost the kingdom because of it. But because of who Jesus is, because of where Jesus is in this, we get opportunity after opportunity after opportunity after opportunity because Jesus never stops relentlessly pursuing us. Now, where, where, the second question is, where are we in this? Th this, to me, is the best part. Because to me, this is the easiest part. Where, are me in th where, where am I in this? Wherever you are right now, wherever you're sitting, this is the last, last thing, and then we're going we're gonna to pray and be done. Wherever you are, I want you to think about this question. Where am I in this? And where you are is you are the pursued. You are the one that is pursued. You have to do nothing to earn it. You do nothing to deserve it. And you can do nothing to stop it. Every day, every minute, every second, you get to be the one that is pursued by our heavenly creator, by our heavenly God. And some of you out there, if you're Christians, you know this, and maybe you need to come back around to this. And then, and then when you decide that, that you're going to accept this, you're going to accept this pursuit of God back into your life, you need to shed some guilt, you need to shed some shame, you need to shed some things that you've been carrying, and then you know what you need to, you need to do? You need to turn around, and you need to find somebody else that needs a reminder that they are pursued, and you need to bring them with you. Now, for, for you out there that's not a Christian, for someone that, that doesn't know about all this Christianity, for someone that doesn't know about all this, you're, where you get to be in this is, is you get to have an opportunity to be pursued by Heavenly Father. And that opportunity will take away all your guilt, all your shame, all your mistakes, all your sin, all your bad choices, all the wisdom you didn't listen to, Everything that you've carried in your life up to this moment, and look, look right here. Look at your computer, your TV screen. Every single, I'm less concerned with the Christians that are watching, more concerned with the non-Christians. Every single one of you guys, you don't have to continue to carry what you're carrying. Because if you listen to one small whisper from God, it all goes away. Unlike Rehoboam, you don't lose the keys to the kingdom forever. But because of Jesus, we can at any point in time be given the keys to the kingdom of God. We can be given opportunity to relationship with him. And for those of you that don't have that relationship and you've never experienced that, well, the keys to that kingdom are right there. And all you have to do is just listen to the most important soft, sweet, gentle voice out there, and that's God's. 
So let's bow our heads and we're going to pray. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you take uh, the story of Rebaum and you take this message, you take it to people. I pray, Father, that, um, that everyone out there was encouraged by it, but more than anything, I pray for the, for the mom, the dad, the son, the daughter, the person, the cousin, whoever it is that just feels like they've made one bad decision after another, after another, after another. And I just pray, Father, that you would, you would show them that through a relationship with you, they can let it all drop away. And all they have to do is just listen to your voice as you call them and they come to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wanna say that if you felt in your heart God speak to you and God called to you, then I want you to reach out to South Point Church. You can email office at southpointchurch.co.za and you can just say, hey, my name is so-and-so and I felt God tugging at my heart and we'll get back in touch with you. But, but you all matter. We may not be doing church in person, but that doesn't mean that the church stops being the church. So we love you and have a great day. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. I'm sure that you really enjoyed this morning's message and hopefully the whole service all together. Don't forget, we need you. So if you're sitting at home and your heart is pounding fast, yes, that's you, we need you. <laughs> so please get in touch with Chris um, and join our great groups of volunteers here. Have an awesome, awesome week. We'll see you guys next week. Ciao.